Uh, okay, so we are entering into the books of history tonight. Um, we are not going to be spending as long on each book as we were for the books of the law, because I kind of feel like the law is the one that needs more attention. So, uh, the first book of history is Joshua. And uh, what happens in the, in the book of Joshua um, stays in the book of Joshua. <laughs> I mean, we're all thinking it, right? You can't just throw one right over the home plate without a strike. Or anyways, uh, so Moses' assistant, long-term assistant Joshua, kind of takes the reins and leads his people uh, into the promised land, and the law kind of gets established as the you know, de facto rule uh, in, in Israel. Uh, some things to consider about the book itself. First off, they never conquered the whole land. One of the uh, misunderstandings that comes up quite a lot in uh, scholarly scholarly debates is um, the historicity of Joshua because, oh, well, how much did Israel really assert their rule? And so people kind of come to this conclusion a lot in the secular world that, that the Bible is inaccurate because Israel didn't become the only occupants of the land. But in Joshua, it never actually claims that they wiped out all the Canaanites. It never says that. In fact, it says the exact opposite in Judges, especially it says, no, they did not conquer the whole land. So it's one of those things that's kind of important to, to focus on. Uh, even w in, in the places that they conquered, they didn't always wipe out all the local inhabitants, um, even when they were supposed to. Uh, and, uh, and the second thing is, in ancient writing, there's this, especially in the ancient Near Eastern world, there's this kind of, there's this way of writing and words that are used that Nowadays, we, we take hyper-literal, but back then they didn't write it like so. So they'd say something like this, um, that they defeated all, or that they killed everyone. And when we think of those terms nowadays, we think, well, all and everyone, that means all and everyone, but that's not how th those words were used back then. Uh, it's more the idea that um, not that every single one of them was killed, but that by and large, they had a victory. That's just kind of how they wrote. And when you read the Egyptian records, they say the exact same thing. When you read the Babylonian records, they say that they talk the exact same way. I the Israelite records, they read the exact same way. They all read the exact same way. They killed everyone. It doesn't actually mean every single one. Uh, once again, that's a little bit difficult nowadays because we think more hyper-literal terms in English, but they didn't really think like that back then. So, uh, number three, uh, there are there are some discrepancies Okay, uh, that I need to make you aware of uh, about what land went to who. In Genesis, it says that the land's going to go to these people, but in Joshua, you see them actually go to these people. So be aware that that is a thing. Um, as far as why that's a thing is a little bit of a more lengthy debate, which we aren't going to get into. But I just want you to want to make you aware of the fact that that yes, when in Genesis it, it says that the land is going to be divided separately from how it actually is divided in Joshua. Uh, the fourth thing, um, so in the law, it says this. It says that when when you get to the promised land, divide the land like this. For bigger tribes, give them bigger plots, and for smaller tribes, give them smaller plots. And then it says, and divide that according to lot. So I that's what Numbers and Deuteronomy say. No numbers. Either Numbers and Deuteronomy or just Numbers. I, I don't really remember. Uh, but when you see it actually happen in Joshua, that's not how it plays out. You see some tribes that are smaller getting much larger allotments, and some tribes that are larger having much smaller allotments. I um, just want to make you aware, aware of that as well. Uh, it seems like the reason why that happened is because of different blessings and curses that happened during Numbers, and also because of um, uh, what the land was used for. So, like, for instance, if you were going to use it for shepherding, you'd have a larger plot of land. That's kind of, once again, a, a kind of a bigger issue. I just want to make you aware of the issue. Um, there's a lot of different ways you could explain that away, but it is something that is, is a thing. The fifth uh, thing I want to mention is holy war. Uh, whenever people get to Joshua, they kind of get a little bit upset because there's the whole holy war thing, which, by and large, we all admit that holy war is usually wrong, right? Like... Adolf Hitler shouldn't go and kill all the Jews, right? Like, we just we understand the idea that holy war is wrong. Uh, but in Joshua, we see that it, you know, is actually condoned and endorsed by God. So it's a little bit, little bit different. Um, and uh, I think what we could say is, 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 I think we could say three quick things about it. First off, holy war was a way that God used to punish the land of Canaan. There's that. Um, remember, these are not innocent people. They were people who were 
sacrificing their children to their gods. They were, I mean, obviously we see the whole Sodom and Gomorrah rape thing that was going on. And what were the other nations around them doing while they were doing this immoral stuff? Nothing. They were doing absolutely nothing to stop it. So if you saw a woman getting raped in the street and you just sat there and watched, you'd probably say, hey, that's probably not good. You'd probably get arrested or something. I mean, right? Like, that's a thing, right? So uh, kind of the similar thing is going on here. Um, and then uh, kind of another big point here is that God owned the land so he could divvy it out according to however he wanted. Um, and uh, then there's the obvious point that Israel wasn't actually told to hunt anybody down. The Canaanites could have left if they so desired. God just said, hey, this land is going to these people, and they're immoral, so attack them. And so this wasn't something that they were supposed to go to the ends of the earth to kill them, um, and which obviously, uh, it, uh, talking about holy war is kind of a big issue. You can't just flippantly dismiss it. But it is something that um, you have to come to grips with the fact that the Bible, in this part, endorsed it. So, I mean, that's something you have to kind of weigh in your own conscience and kind of um, work through it. But as I mentioned before, the Bible is full of a lot of stuff like that where you have to just kind of work through a lot of big issues. Uh, the sixth thing and the last thing I want to mention about Joshua before we get to the uh, dates and all that stuff is uh, Israel was still worshiping idols in part. Um, throughout most of their history, they were still worshiping idols. There wasn't like a moment where they said, okay, uh, we're putting away all the idols, and then they actually did. Right, like so. Even when Moses was leading th them in the, in the in the desert, they still had some traces of the idols. And then, I mean, even even when you look at archaeological proof of you know the worship of Yahweh, you almost always see um, Yahweh being worshipped alongside Asher and all these different gods. And the reason is because <laughs> not not that uh, some modern historians say something along the lines of this. It's because uh, Ashira was Yahweh's uh, consort or uh, their wife or some some such. It's not like that at all. It's just that the people who were worshiping Yahweh were also worshiping these other gods at the same time, and that so it left a, an archaeological record of that. Um, so, anyways, moving on to some more things about Joshua itself. First off, uh, it was written. You can't uh, you can't obviously say for fact because it never actually says, but you can kind of piece some things in. And it seems like it was written sometime during Joshua's conquest, so about the 1400s, after 1400s, um, and edited at some point afterwards. We don't really know exactly when, but so basically after 1400s. When did the events happen? Pretty much at the same time, around the 1400s. Um, Joshua was, was doing this conquest uh, pretty early into, late into the 1400s, early into the 1300s. Um, and we don't really know who it was written by, uh, we can assume that Joshua at least took preliminary notes, but I mean, we we can't really go much further than that. The main theme of Joshua um, is kind of along the lines of I it's really focused on the inheritance of the blessing itself. So you could say something along the lines of this, okay? That Joshua is a book about contrast when it comes to God's blessing, either him inheriting the blessing or a warning against rebelling against his ways. So a good example, let me give you an example of what I'm trying to say, and I think I'll make it a lot clearer. Uh, it's in the book of Joshua that we see Rahab, a foreigner, immoral prostitute, saved and become part of the people of Israel. And we see Achan, an Israelite man, who was a part of the community already, killed along with his whole family. So it's a book about kind of like contrast. So we, you, you see a lot of people who should be punished who are entered into the, into the blessing and the people who should be part of the blessing entered into the curse instead. And so it's kind of a, an, it's a the main theme is kind of the inheritance of the blessing and kind of contrast those two things. Um, so um, obviously this had some far-reaching impact of, you know, uh, what would happen in the future. I mean, Israel unfortunately got this idea that they couldn't receive a curse because they were God's people. And... Uh, well, that turned out to be very wrong, and Joshua kind of hints towards that being wrong. As far as breaking down the book itself, uh, it divides phenomenally well into two main sections. Chapters 1 through 12, talking uh, kind of about conquering the land itself, and then chapter 13 through 21, about dividing the land. It, it separates very nicely in those two sections. Uh, there, there's a few, a few so-whats we can kind of draw attention to. 
what does it matter that Joshua is a part of the Bible? Would we have really been at any loss with it not being there? Well, there's a few things that I think that it shows. First off, holy war is brutal and calls into question God's love and goodness, and that's something that Joshua does not shy away from. It faces it head on. Uh, Joshua doesn't uh, doesn't doesn't shy away from that. It, it it emphasizes the way that God is loving, but also holy. Uh, it also teaches the idea this holy whole holy war idea kind of. Uh, true love requires jealousy, right? Like you wouldn't share your wife. Same is true for God not sharing uh, himself among with other other gods. Just absolutely not. Um, and uh, we live in a <laughs> we live in a culture, unfortunately, where they kind of downplay that kind of stuff. But it is it is important for there to be some standard in our sexual relationships. So how much more should there be a standard in our spiritual relationships? Uh, and that's something Joshua, once again, tackles head on. Another important point that Joshua brings out, uh, somewhat more so than other books of the Bible, is that true justice requires action. You can't really say that God is a just God if he will leave the guilty unpunished. People have a really hard time with this. Oh, God, uh, you know, God is, uh, God is loving, so why is there so much evil in the world? And then, then the moment that God brings punishment on the wicked, well, <laughs> what the hey, man? You know, it's like, well, I- w- which one do you want? Do you want God to be just or love demands justice and justice demands action. So for God to love and be just, he has to do something about immorality. And Joshua gives us an option there uh, that, uh, yeah, they should be punished. Uh, so it's, 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 it's definitely a book. If it was a person, I think Joshua would be one of those, uh, you know, those country girls, real opinionated country girls. I think Joshua would be one of the, would that would be the the physical representation of Joshua. It, just, it doesn't shy away from it. It just barges right in there. Uh, eh, maybe a little bit more loud mouth than some of the other uh, biblical books. Uh, although victory wasn't absolute for Israel, uh, it was given by God as they responded in trust. See, the more that they trusted God, the more they had victory. And this is something that ju- Judges is going to really emphasize on. Uh, so Joshua shows God's faithfulness, his direction, his character, his blessings. And uh, any questions on Joshua? Okay, so then Judges. Judges is an interesting book because it was written much, it seems like, I shouldn't say much, but it appears as though it was written much later than Joshua, but it really plugs in very nicely in that in-between stage between Joshua and uh, Samuel. So um, there, there's two main ideas in, in, in Judges. That l- I'm, I'm going to have myself. So what happens in Judges? Let's start with that. Uh, Israel becomes more like the Canaanites. That's one of the big things that happens in Judges. Uh, God removes blessings. And you see them having gr- occasional victories in their slow decline. One of the main ideas that is repeated numerous times in the book of Judges is this. There was no king in those days, so everybody just did whatever was right in their own eyes. It's repeated over and over again. Um, and you see uh, redeemers rise and then fall, and it seems like Israel never gets any better, but slowly gets worse, even with these redeemers coming along. Uh, so t- some, some things to consider about the book of Judges itself. First off, Judges is not a book about the good guy. I mentioned this in the message this morning. It's not a book about the good people and the bad people. It's a book about the gray. Everyone does right in their own eyes, which means that there's some things that they do that are really good and some things that, th- things that they do that's really not good. Um, they are not always examples for us to follow all the time, but warnings. Um, I, I mentioned in this morning about Samson, how he, you know he did great things by the strength of the Holy Spirit, but he was also a very immoral person. Uh, Gideon, we looked at it. He, yes, he, he did li- lead Israel into victory, but he also didn't trust God. Um, there's, um, I want to say it's Shamgar, but that, that doesn't sound right. Uh, the guy who brings a great victory, but also potentially sacrifices his daughter. I mean, these are things, it, it's, it's a book of, of people who aren't really good people or bad people. It's not like there's a bunch of Jesuses and Satans. It's not like that. There's a bunch of gray characters doing what seems right in their own eyes. The second thing about Judges, Israel didn't fully conquer the land because of two main reasons. First off, uh, their lack of trust in God. And number two, their immorality. And you see th- in the book of Judges, they're kind of just like one among many. You, you, you left with the question, what really separates them from the Canaanites? And the answer, their covenant with God. That's it. I mean, they weren't really that separate as far as action. It's more of God that made them separate and different. 
Uh, third thing about judges, the land was not united; it was fragmented. Um, we shouldn't go. We shouldn't kind of assert our our later views of Israel into the judges period. The tribes were not all on the same page. They were they they there was no like unifying factor. They just kind of all lived interspersed, and once again, they all kind of just did whatever they wanted to. Um, I mean, you get to the end of the book, and uh, the tribe of Benjamin's almost wiped out. And so their their game plan is to go and abduct some women <laughs> or young girls that are just minding their own business. <laughs> yeah, there, there's your wife. Go go snag you a wife. You know? <laughs> and that's kind of how the book uh, book ends. You know, this isn't a book you know that really um, has a whole united thing going on. So uh, the fourth thing about judges leadership is a very big main theme. So as a, as a result of that, it has some very important valuable lessons if you're in ministry. Um, and then the fifth thing, it seems like a cycle. That they have this cycle, this ongoing cycle of messing up, a redeemer coming, things going good, and and then them going back. It, but it it shouldn't be seen as a cycle. It should seen be seen more as a spiral because their culture is gradually getting worse and worse, even with the uprising of redeemers. Uh, so when was it written? It was written the earliest it, c- it could have been written, judging from the things that it says where places were called and that kind of stuff. The earliest that it could have been written was during David's reign. That's the earliest it could have written, been written. The latest, judging once again from the way that it says up until this day, or this place was called this at, the, at that time, it says that all throughout the book. So the latest it could have been written is sometime after Israel's fall. Uh, so that's between 722 and, uh, so somewhere in the 600s, basically, uh, B.C., obviously. And uh, when, when do the events happen? The events happen, this is the, this is the only book that covers, well, no, I shouldn't say that. Uh, this and Ruth is the, are the only two books that cover this uh, period of Israelite history. Uh, and that's the time between the end of Joshua and the beginning of First Samuel. So that's like the 1300s to the 1000s. Um, King Saul was, was early on in the, thou- or I guess because we're going backwards, so late on in the 1000s. Um, as far as who wrote it, nobody really knows. Uh, there's been some ideas that were thrown out, but nothing that really stuck. Um, the main theme of the book of Judges, the need of a righteous king. That's the first main theme. It's actually got two main themes. Uh, the second main theme could could just... Well, it... it <laughs> The two main themes are kind of the need for Israel's king, uh, for for Israel to have a righteous king, but also just kind of the the kind of the downward downward spiral of a society that doesn't honor God. It's kind of twofold. Uh, so there's kind of a destructive societal nature of rebellion to God. It's something that you know everybody thinks, oh, we're going to make a better world by removing gods and and you know by just doing whatever seems right to your conscience, but it doesn't it doesn't work. And judges is a good example of that. Um, uh, also, there's the uh, the danger of becoming like the society and compromising on evil. Once again, cu- cultures always try to do this. They try to compromise to evil to try and make things more peaceful. Uh, if we just give a little ground, but it never works like that. You compromise to evil, you get more evil, and then you're further down than you were before. Um, so uh, as far as breaking the book up, <coughs> It, it breaks up into three sections very well. The first section being that of the kind of primer to why things happen, with the f- emphasis kind of on the tribes. The second section being on the judges, which kind of shows the development of the problem. And then the last section showing uh, the kind of shattered tribes, just everything hitting a rock bottom. Uh, so in, in the beginning of the book, we actually see the, the problem itself. What's going to cause the end of the book to happen is mentioned in the beginning of the book. Um, and then when the judges take uh, take hold, this isn't something that should be seen as a good thing. Um, they had no central leadership. This is something that the, the problem is developing uh, further and further. Um, so so what? W- what does it matter that judges is in our Bible that it has you know what it has to say to us? Well, there's a few things. First off, it is very important that we stay unique from the world as Christians. It's very very important. Um, we're not called to be like the world. We're called to live apart from the world. And Judges is one of the books that really emphasizes that stronger than a lot of the other books. Um, uh, but uh, there's kind of this thing that we do, and this is why Paul directly addresses this, is we somewhere in our thinking, we think to live in an immoral culture, we need to absolutely stay refrained from them so we don't become like them. Um, monks did this, um, and you know, all throughout Christian history, we've struggled with this. But the problem is, is 
Paul talks about this. When I told you to stay away from these kinds of people, I wasn't talking about people in the world. I was talking about people who call themselves Christians in the church who are acting like this. This is in 1 Corinthians. So it, it, it Judges doesn't really give us too much of that two-part of living in an immoral culture. It's more focused on the negative, degrading effect of living in, immoral, in, an, in an immoral culture. So even while we still live in it and, and love those in it, we're still staying separate from it. Uh, the second thing that I think Judges shows extremely well is people left to their own devices always spiral towards evil. Without God in the mix, we always spiral. And we always convince ourselves, too, like, this time we can do it. This time, and we do it in the world, but we also do it in the, in the church, too. It's okay if I miss a couple days reading the Bible. It's okay. I'm a strong enough Christian. I, it's okay. But then we get, like, a week down, and we just start feeling kind of crummy, and a week, another week goes, and we're feeling worse. I mean, think about this. If we in the church are doing this, think about how much more those in the world are doing it, and it just leaves you uh, obviously lacking. So, yes, left to our own devices, we spiral. And I think human history, not just American history, but human history shows us that. And then the third and final thing that I think um, makes Judges unique uh, in its lessons for us, we all fa face temptation of being our final authority. It doesn't matter if we're talking about against the pastor or against the government or against God. We all have a, a, some kind of rebellion deep in our, in our loins uh, <laughs> where we have this temptation to be our own authority, you know. Um, part of the reason why we have so much conflict in our marriages uh, because it's the question of who, who's going to run the roost. And that takes us to the book of Ruth, which is the last book we're going to look at tonight. Um, a very interesting book. Uh, it's a very short book, but, but still very interesting. What happens? The outcasts of society <laughs> become the ancestors of the king. An amazing, <laughs> an amazing book. So what I mean by the outcasts of society... The main character that's first introduced, Naomi, she's a widow, so already she would have had scorn on her for being, well, surely there was a reason why your husband and sons died. It's something you did wrong. So there's, there's her. And obviously she's, old, uh, she's getting older, too, uh, so she's outlived her usefulness. Uh, and then there's a second, per a second per a character, Ruth, uh, who's a godless foreigner, and she turns out to be the one that the blessing comes through. <laughs> and then you have uh, Boaz, just some old guy out there, and yet he's the one who brings about the blessing. And it's like, you know, you have these outcasts of society, and that's who the book is about, these outcasts. And they become, uh, you know, the, the, ans the, the ancestors of, of uh, King David. So it <laughs> it, it <laughs> I was going to make a joke about the Dirty Dozen, but moving on. Uh <laughs> Some things to consider about the book of Ruth. Five things. First off, Ruth's coming to Boaz at night. There's, a, there's kind of an idea in some people's mind that when Ruth goes to Boaz at night towards the center of the book somewhere and she lays down by his feet and covers herself, that this is something sexual. This is nothing sexual. Nothing sexual at all. There's no reason to assume that. Rather, it's a way of asking for protection. Um, to, for, for somebody to spread out their garment over you is like a sign of protection. It's like kind of like the imagery of, uh, of a mother chicken, you know, putting its putting its feathers over the baby chicks. Um, it basically, she's asking for him to take her as a, as, as, as a wife, as in take her into, her household, into the household. And that's why she says, your maidservant, uh, Ruth. Uh, she's more appealing to him to, to intervene on her behalf. And that's why the very next day, he goes to steps to uh, marry her to secure her place uh, in the land. So, uh, so you know, it, it, it's... it's um, a little bit cultural, obviously, and a little bit um, awkward. I, I think I'd feel a little bit weird if there was just some woman sleeping at my feet <laughs> in the middle of the night. I'd be like, what are you doing down there? <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, the second thing about uh, Ruth uh, to consider, and this isn't really a factor so much for us nowadays, but it was in the ancient world. At the, at the beginning of the book, Naomi says this. She says, go back to your land, go back to your families. And um, the other girl, uh, uh, what? Orpha or something like that. Uh, you, you know the woman I'm talking about. She's like, okay, yeah, see ya. She just said, oh, I'll go with you, Naomi. I'll go with you. And then as soon as Naomi says, go back, she's like, oh, yeah, sure. That sounds like a good idea. I'll do that. But Ruth on the end, she says, no, I'm going with you. Wherever you go is wherever I go. And this is the significance of that. For her to return back to her land would not mean returning back to her physical location so much as everything that instilled that. 
gods were local gods. So there was a, if you lived in a certain area, there was the god of that region, right? So if you lived in Rudoso, you'd serve the god of the mountain, whatever god that would be. And so if you moved back to Rudoso, you'd serve that god. So for her to go back to her land would have been to go back to her gods, go back to her family, go back to all that made her a foreigner. And so when she denies this and she says, no, I'm going to go wherever you go, she's literally taking on an entire new, new identity and saying, don't call me by the Moabites, call me by the Israelites. This is a very important uh, moment for her. And uh, the third thing, Ruth, the book of Ruth depends heavily on the law. And if you're not familiar with the law, some things are just not going to make much sense. So the first thing uh, that th th it refers to strongly is the idea of landowners. So when you were harvesting your grain or whatever, there was this, this, this rule that, that Israel had um, for the poor where when you were gleaning your fields, you had to leave whatever fell. You couldn't, you couldn't pick it clean. And Ruth uh, makes reference of that numerous times. A second law uh, is called the law of uh, kinship, the kinship redeemer. And the basic idea of this is if you, so if your spouse dies, <laughs> you could get married to the next closest relative, and the child that was born, this only applies if, this, if the person who died didn't leave an heir, the person that, w that died I mean, so the, 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 the person that you married, the, the child that you produced would be counted as the son or daughter of the person who died, not as your child. This is a very important point because by Boaz taking Ruth in as his wife, what he's saying is, I'm helping your family, and if, and if she does produce a child, he loses out on an inheritance. And this is the issue. Ruth has someone who's closer than Boaz. And it sounds like a good idea because he's like, hey, Naomi's already old. She's not going to have any more kids. I can take Naomi. And so then Boaz gives the, cl the clincher, oh, you'd also have to take Ruth. And now the deal is different because that mean this is a young, younger woman. She's able to still produce an heir. So now it's, it's, a, it's a risky investment because t it might go to you, but it also might not, and you might have to div divide your, your, your inheritance between your kids and your not kids. So once this guy hears that, he says, never mind, I'm out. So he says, okay, but you you got to make a sign before these witnesses that, that you don't want this. And so he takes off his shoe and so on and so forth, um, which is a sign of, ma uh, you know, basically it's, it's, a, it's, a it's a sign of shame that you, it, it, yeah, long story, but anyways, uh, and so then Boaz is able to marry Ruth under the kinship redeemer and bear the heir, which is not his heir. It's Naomi's heir. So his, his inheritance gets divided. So uh, this was a loss for Boaz. He took that loss for the sake of blessing Ruth and Naomi. So it's kind of a, an important point that's lost on us because we don't really practice that. Um, so anyways... Oh, and also the land would not go to Boaz, but it would go to the heir. That's kind of an important point, too. Hmm. Especially since Boaz was getting older, um, he wouldn't be able to have any more uh, opportunities. So then the fourth thing about Ruth, uh, the idea of being redeemed points forward to God who spreads his wings over us. A big idea of um, Ruth is the idea of a foreigner being covered with the blessing. And that's something that kinship redeemer is something that we see fulfilled ultimately in Christ. And the fifth thing with Ruth, Ruth was an outsider but gained greatly. So everything that she lost, she gains back. She loses her family. She gets a new one. She loses her God. She gets a new one. She loses her land. She gets a new one. You get what I mean? It's, it's a book of, yes, yeah, she had to give it all away, but she inherited it. And she actually got much better than she had in, in, in Moab. It just didn't seem like that at the beginning. Um, obviously, David was a forerunner of the Messiah. Well, we all know that. Um, and this is a book about welcoming Gentiles, which is exactly what Jesus would lay do in greater, uh, 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 greater capacity. And that kind of brings an interesting idea. Before I go on to the who wrote it and all that, it's something that Jesus said. He says, "Those who love their life will lose it." But those who lo lose it, for me, will, will, will gain it. And, and that's what we see with Boaz. Um, he didn't love his life, but he rather you know, gave it up. And Ruth and the whole family was benefited from it. So when was it written? It was written sometime during David's reign, most likely, um, especially given the emphasis on David 
and uh, the events happen sometime during the period of the judges. We don't know exactly when, but uh, it was so think of it being at you know while judges is going on with all the redeemers and all that. Somewhere else, <laughs> the book of Ruth is happening. Um, uh, Ru- who is written by? Nobody really knows. There's there's some speculation about Samuel, but um, it seems like he was already dead by the time that some of these events happened. Uh, for instance, um, David he never actually lived to see David as the king. So why would he have written a book as though it had already been happened when he died before it happened? I mean, it could have happened. He could have been writing it in the faith of what would have happened. That that could have happened. But ultimately, there's no reason to assume that it was uh, Samuel. Um, which brings an interesting point. Be careful to say s- very strongly that somebody wrote a book if it, their name is not actually on the book. Like Paul says, hey, I wrote this to you. Okay, Paul wrote that book. <laughs> you know, but just you know, all the other ones are, are kind of you know, a little bit iffy. Um, the main theme of Ruth, redemption. Um, you you do see God's, what's it called? Uh, where God is working behind the behind the scene. Uh, I always forget this word. Providence. It it it, it does kind of have the idea of God's providence, like the Book of Esther does, but that's not really the main uh, theme in Esther. Redemption is really the main theme, as far as an outline. Now, this is <laughs> uh, the outline. So, uh, there's two basic ideas of how you can outline Ruth, and they're both right. It's just whichever one you prefer. Uh, the first is a chiasm. If you guys remember a chiasm, it starts like A, and it ends on A, and then the next point is B, and the next point coming out is B. And so it has like a central theme. Remember that? So it kind of goes like this. Central theme, it goes back, and it kind of repeats itself. So like the Tower of Babel is, is a chiasm. You know, it starts with, um, uh, they're building this in the land of Shinar. They built this in the land of Shinar. And then the, the main theme of that is, then God came down, you know. So uh, in Ruth, the main theme would be right at the center of the book, um, Naomi is talking about Boaz, and she says something along the lines of, um, hey, he's your kinship redeemer, and then she blesses him. Her and, Na- her and uh, Naomi and Ruth are talking. And uh, I don't remember all that all that's said, but she she blesses um, Boaz. It's right there in the center, in, in the middle of the book. And um, so, yeah, when that, and so then the obvious main idea of the book would be um, the redeemer, you know, uh, but you can you can kind of draw your own chiasm if you read through the book and kind of see the repeated themes in reverse. Uh, and then the, the second way you can outline the book is um, seeing it as a series of scenes. Kind of think of a drama or a play. Uh, and so in that way, y- each chapter really works well as each scene. So, so think of chapter one as act one. So think of chapter two as act two. And so you're seeing it kind of unfold. And uh, it has all the typical stuff, you know, the setting in the very beginning, and it has kind of the dra- the dramatic uh, climax and then uh, the resolution at the end. So what? What does it matter that Ruth is in our Bible? What does it matter that, what does it have to offer? Is it, it couldn't have been just listed in one of the other books. Well, there's a, quite a few things. Um, no other book of the Bible really emphasizes the idea of a redeemer quite as strongly as Ruth does. And that's pretty unique. Uh, but that's not the only thing. Even before Israel asked for a king, God was paving the way for them to get a king. See, they didn't know that they were going to ask for a king when all this stuff was happening with Naomi. And yet, here's God preparing a future king. It, it, th- that kind of stuff is amazing because, so Deuteronomy says, hey, one of these days you guys are going to get a king. You know, watch out for this. And then First Samuel comes along and they say, you know what, we don't want God as our king. We want an actual physical human king. And so God says, hey, Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And so he's like, okay, whatever, let's, let's go do this. So he goes and anoints King Saul. And you can see him kind of, you know, upset about the whole process. And then King Saul gets uh, rejected as king, and he really gets upset about that until finally God tell, he tells him, look, Samuel, how long are you going to sit around and, and pout about this, basically? Uh, get up, go, there's another one you need to anoint, and that's where David enters the scene. So whereas for Samuel, this is a very frustrating situation that he's having to minister in. For God, he was already preparing David way back before Samuel was even into in the picture, you know. And it, it, I think it, it really says a lot about the way that God um, just really has His own time frame, His own things. Because we get wrapped up in our own schedules, and we get really distraught when something messes up how we think things should go. But Ruth shows us that God's still working behind the scenes, even when that's a thing. Um, 
and David, of course, would be the king after uh, God's own heart. Um, and, and that brings up an, another interesting point. Naomi had no idea, and her despair was a huge weight for her, but it brought a great blessing in the end. And uh, she had no idea that this was happening. So it was all happening behind closed doors. And that's just such an interesting uh, interesting concept. So was there any questions about any of the books that we looked at tonight, Joshua, Judges, or Ruth? Nope. Okay. Uh, next week we'll look at the Samuels and the Kings and probably the, the Chronicles as well. Um, no. So, Lord, thank you for your word. And uh, help us to, uh, to always get more out of it than we did yesterday. Uh, that you'd speak to us through it. And... Uh, Lord, that you just come alive to us as, as we seek you. We love you, Lord.